here. So insights for this week. Woo! Um, <laughs> first of all, insights that I've been a part of. <laughs> um, so what are we going to talk about this week? Um, the topic is how to kickflip. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I suggested this to Mizko and he said, no deal because we can't monetize kickflips. <laughs> So, yeah, I had to go with a different topic. But, I mean, we could try to monetize it. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater did like $1.4 billion in sales, so that's pretty legit. Um, anyway, instead, to make Mizco happy, we're going to be on the topic of monetization and talk about conversion tactics, um, sort of specifically the psychology of, um, you know, converting. So persuasion, conversion's friend is um, sort of perceived as a bit of a dirty word sometimes, but it's really not because um, you can persuade people to you know, break bad habits, um, change their worldviews for the better, persuade them to try to reach higher levels of personal fulfillment and uh, improve their communities. So you know, some of the companies that we work with um, could benefit from conversion tactics and persuasion like you know, health services, insurances, education charities, um, you know, dealing with substance abuse, environmental uh, causes, that type of thing. So the conversion tactics that um, I think are really good to have in your sort of toolbox and uh, sort of in the back of your mind are, are listed out here. So I'll definitely be sharing this slide and all slides. Um, so if, you, if you're if you interested, take the time to dig a bit deeper into these, you know, uh, there's a couple favorites of mine here. Social proof, obviously, we use that. We're all familiar with it, sort of um, highlighting scarcity, anchoring, uh, priming, um, you know, having a sense of authority and providing evidence, um, a bit of like data driven um, kind of, you know, information to support your arguments can be really powerful as well. So, we're going to look at four of these tactics. Um, but before we do, to ensure that you're all engaged, there's a bit of a pop quiz. Um, so I'm going <laughs> to call on one of you guys to participate in a second. So these three man-made structures, they took a long time to build. The Colosseum took 10 years to build. The Great Pyramids of Giza took a whopping 20 years. And then we have right out there the York Minister Cathedral took 252 years to build. So um, there's another building that took even longer. Um, so it says anyone, but Lucy, I'm going to pick on you. How many years did the longest building take to build? You muted. Oh, gosh. I, I'm not very familiar with architecture, but I'm just going to throw a random number out there. I'm going to say... If it's longer than 252, I'm going to guess maybe 400. 400. Okay. Well, the uh, answer is it took 2,000 years. So you're a couple hundred years off there, 1,600 years off. I was close. Um, I was close. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm picking on you right now, but why were you so off? It's because of a technique called anchoring. Um, so basically, if we were to um, think about anchoring, it's forming a cognitive bias towards a um, piece of information that you're exposed to first. So in the topic, I mean, in those examples there, you know, I showed you 10 years, 20 years, and then an outlier of um, 250 years. But that's really kind of on the lower spectrum um, when you consider, you know, Stonehenge 1600 years now. Sort of thing. So if I showed you these two, surely your um, answer would have been a lot higher and probably closer to 2000. But yeah, you were just really anchored to that initial piece of information. Um, so there's some pretty cool studies. The uh, Nobel uh, Prize winner in economics um, has this study where they tested a bunch of um, students and they ask them to do an equation. You can see there's two different equations there. And um, one of them you know, starts at eight, goes down to one. The other one starts at one, goes to eight. So the hypotheses were that the students um, you know, asked to do the equation starting with eight would give a higher number because um, eight 
compared to one is is higher. So, um, and the students starting the equation at um, you know one through to eight would give a lower final uh, guess. The students were also um, stopped halfway when doing the equation and asked to give the uh, final guess as well. So at the point where they were stopped, um, the number that they uh, were last on, whether it was high or low, the hypothesis was that their final guess would be higher or lower as well. So group A, the average answer um, was 2,000 and group B was about 500. Um, so that first hypothesis was proved correct in that um, the group starting with eight, uh, their sort of guess was higher than the group starting at one. So they were anchored to that first um, series of numbers. And the actual um, end the calculation was 40,000. So the guesses, um, given, which I haven't listed here, but were also uh, like much lower depending, and, and they were anchored towards that first initial number as well. Um, so a example where we're thinking about, you know, dollar value is um, another test that involved um, students writing down the last two digits of their social security numbers. So, um, you know, string of numbers at the end of it, uh, it could have been a one and a one, or it could have been a nine and a nine. And uh, the sort of hypothesis was that um, in, in a bid, a blind bid on some items, um, that those with the uh, smaller, who wrote down the smaller digits um, would have lower um, bids than those who wrote down the higher digits. And what they were bidding on was a bottle of wine, a, a tennis ball and a, um, a book, like a textbook as well. So the uh, result was that the people who wrote down 99 or the higher social security numbers were 346 um, percent more. They paid more, 346 percent more on those on those items in that blind bid. Um, so missing a lot of detail, but yeah, you can look at the study later if you want to fact check that. So. The second tactic is consistency. Um, I purposely chose tactics that I think are a bit less familiar. Um, so consistency is about the sort of uh, you know human desire to stay consistent with our decisions. Um, and if we sort of make one decision first and then we're prompt with another decision, we'll try to we'll, we'll factor in that first decision and it will influence the second one. Um, so yeah, it's used. It, people use it to um, try to, you know, use less cognitive energy and uh, solve problems a bit more effectively. So an example of that is um, a study that involved participants being asked to hang a sign in their yard. So this particular sign was a little slow down sign to try to help the community. Group A was asked to um, put a really large sign in their yard. Um, and group B was asked to put a little tiny sign in their yards, in their window, which was legitimately a couple centimeters um, wide and high. And then a week later, they were asked to put that same large sign. So the hypothesis is those that are asked to do something are gonna feel like they should be consistent and do the large sign as well. So the results were that group A with the large sign straight away, only 20% said yes, whereas group B 55% said yes to the large sign and the small sign. Um, so they yeah put two signs um, instead and they were more likely to do that just because they wanted to seem consistent with their first answer. So the next tactic we're gonna look at is loss aversion, which um, you know apparently can be more than twice as powerful as the opposite of you know, offering some sort of um, gain instead. Um, so a study was taking place where um, a, a reward of 0 0.5 cents was given every time somebody used a non-plastic bag um, versus a, um, a group where they were taxed 0 0.5 cents every time they used a plastic bag. So they could gain um, group A was gaining 0.5 cents, group B was losing 0.5 cents. And 
for group A, there was a 0% uh, decline in plastic bag usage. It had no effect the reward at all because people you know, perceived gaining 0.5 cents as nothing. Whereas group B, um, there was a 42% decline in plastic bag use um, just because they were given the ultimatum of a loss of a, uh, yeah, losing something. Um, so the last tactic that we're going to talk about in the next three minutes um, so that Philippe can get to his meeting is the relativity factor. So all the quotes so far have been by, you know, famous organizations. This one is me because I ran out of time and just needed to jot it down. So it's a bit dodgy, but the brain seeks to make comparisons when uh, making decisions. People can be guided into perceiving things a certain way when sh shown relationships between things. Um, so you can kind of also sway people with a decoy. Um, if you want somebody to choose a particular thing, then you can put something else with it as a decoy that is, um, you know, in some way similar or guiding them towards a particular choice. So a bit abstract, but it will make more sense in a second. Um, there was a study by The Economist. This was a actual, um, you know, part of their offering where uh, I feel like Philippe knows this one, but a subscription, a print subscription was listed as $125 and a digital as $65 on their website. Um, so 68% of people went with the digital digital option um, for $65. So The Economist was uh, not making as much profit in that case. Um, they were making yeah, $65, um, but the print, they would have actually, it would have benefited the company a bit more. Um, so what they did was introduce a, uh, like use the print as a decoy and um, they introduced another option where you could, for the same price as the print, get the print and the digital. And from the economy's, uh, economist's perspective, that's no real change in um, efforts. But the result was that instead of um, you know, 64 going for the digital, now 84% of people went for the print and the digital at $125 instead of $65. So that's a pretty substantial um, difference just by introducing another option and another price that shows a relationship between sort of the value of what you're getting. Um, so it actually, relativity works in you know multi multiple dimensions like uh, visuals as well. When you kind of glance at this on the left, that in a circle looks much bigger um, than the one on the right, but the truth is that they're exactly the same size, which is a bit of a you know mind trip. Um, but yeah, so those are the sort of four tactics that I wanted to touch on. Um, and yeah, ways to remember them, you know, set an anchor, um, consistency, get people saying yes, get them on a yes train before you ask that hard question. Um, and loss aversion, losses hurt more than wins feel good, and relativity, uh, use relationships between things to kind of sway people either way. So some great books um, that I've read and sort of used the inspiration for uh, listed out here. Predictably Irrational is um, the you know, top, my top favorite out of those. So yeah, I'll send this slide through, but thanks guys, stoked that uh, you could be part of the first you know, raw insights and we reached exactly on time.